Journey of the Sparrows, Chapter 2 I fell asleep again and dreamed, and in my dream the wind picked me up, so I sailed through the air, stretching my arms and legs as far as they could reach. Then the wind swept me home to my village and set me down gently outside our house of clay and sticks. I stood in the doorway, looking at the dark coolness inside, and I heard my mother patting tortillas and singing to herself as she rocked Teresa. The day when you were born, all the flowers were born too. The day when you were born, the nightingales sang. I heard laughter and turned to see Julia and me as young girls. We sat giggling and shucking corn on burlap bags under our shed of sticks. Julia's legs were spread and her bare feet pressed into mounds of noontime dust, but she kept her face and shoulders in the shadows. Even so, her forehead and upper lip were wet with sweat as she worked. I sat farther in the shadows of the shed, rubbing corn cobs together and listening to Julia talk about Ramon. Julia's eyes, like mine, were as dark as coffee, but she had no dimple in her chin, and her skin was pale, like a light brown dove. I saw her reach out with an ear of corn as she laughed, and I followed the movement of her arm, but then I glanced down at my darker arms and legs, and I frowned. Julia noticed my frown. Maria, she said, you're growing up. Boys will notice you soon. See, I'll show you how big you are. Hold your hands up against mine. So we pressed our damp hands together in the coolness of the shed, but the difference in color was the difference between the sun and shadows, and I turned my face away from my sister. When I woke up, it was morning. I squinted into the sun that streamed in through a cracked, lace-curtained window. The light was so bright after the darkness of the crate that I felt tears in my eyes. My whole body ached and I groan when I moved. My arms and legs were bruised and swollen, and my hands were raw from banging on the crate. I was still on the floor, covered with a blanket, but now only Tomas was near me. He lay in the same place he'd sat the night before and moaned in his sleep. I could hear Mexican music from another room. My eyes adjusted to the light as I looked around. The room seemed bright with colors. One wall was a sharp yellow, the others were white, a picture with orange daisies hung to the left of the window, and a cross with large plastic purple and pink flowers, those put on graves in Mexico, was fastened to the wall on the right. A big poster of a red-headed woman, laughing and holding a glass of beer, hung above the couch. The words, Mi gusta carta blanca, were written on it. Chains of gold and silver foil hung from one ceiling corner to another, and I thought of Christmas decorations I'd seen in a store. Then I saw the television. It was turned off, but I'd never been so close to one before. I stood up, aching as I did, walked to the television, and gently swept my fingers across the smooth screen. The statue of San Antonio was placed carefully on a blue towel on top of the television, and a calendar with a blonde Jesus holding a sheep was hung above it. As I reached out to touch the saint, Marta appeared in the doorway and motioned me to join her. I stepped into a kitchen and saw Julia sitting on a chair. She held Oscar on her lap against her pregnant stomach. Our lady, I thought to myself, you've brought us here alive. Marta, a short, plump woman, was dressed as brightly as the colors in her home. Oh, mijita, she said to me in her big, hearty voice as she examined one of my bruised arms, then the other. Damn coyotes, they treated you so bad I'd make the blessed virgin swear. Outrageous, outrageous. She clicked her tongue and shook her head, her chest jiggling with the motion. Julia and Oscar were also bruised and battered. Marta sat back down and two little girls, their faces round like Marta's, came to stand partly behind her. Images of saints, bright plastic flowers, and a poster of puppies with huge eyes were thumbtacked to the cracked yellow walls of the kitchen. A light bulb hung from the ceiling, a bag of potatoes lay in a cardboard box on the floor, and water from a faucet trickled into a sink. The radio playing music was on the counter, and a half-empty bread bag lay open on the table. My stomach jerked with hunger. Julia lifted a cup of water to Oscar's lips and looked at me. Her voice was fearful. Oscar can't talk, she said to me, and his eyes keep rolling. I bent down to Oscar, patted him on the face, and shook his arm. Oscar, Oscar, little sparrow, look at me, it's Maria. 
Oscar glanced in my direction, then his eyes rolled up and to the right. The pain that was already in my chest grew tighter. How long has he been like this? asked Julia. When I was up during the night, he seemed better, but since he woke up this morning, his eyes have been rolling and he won't talk. Marta sighed. She wore a low-cut blouse, and she reached in her bra and pulled out a handkerchief. She wiped the hanky across her forehead. So many kids get hurt like that. Holy cats. Suddenly, she threw up her hands and her voice became high-pitched. One of my nephews died along the way. People try so hard. You think this was the land of cream and honey. Tomas made the crossing once before, and we didn't hear about him for nine days. She reached across the table and felt Oscar's face. How was Oscar before you left Mexico? He was weak from not eating, but not like this, Julia answered. Oscar's very smart, I said. When we were still home, I was teaching him how to read. Pobrecito, pobrecito, poor boy, Marta said, patting Oscar's hand. Doña Elena will try to help you. She nodded toward an empty chair. Here, Maria, sit down and have some coffee and bread. I sat and bolted down the bread she handed me, its sweetness relieving my hunger. Then I looked at Oscar. He was wearing underpants stained brown and a shirt without buttons. He seemed so small on Julia's lap. His bruised legs were spindly and his knees were swollen like a child with worms. I thought of the way he used to balance mostly on one foot, his eyes wide and blinking when he seemed to be thinking of something special. I had looked after him at home. He was always with me, taking all the time, talking all the time and following me in and out of the house to the cornfields and to the well, usually trying to carry more rocks than his hands could hold. One time he found a sparrow with a broken leg. I helped him nurse the sparrow, and for some days he'd carried the bird in one hand, little stones in the other. I called him Little Oscar Sparrow. Marta pulled her red scarf off her short black hair and said, I've been here four years this time, left five kids in Mexico with my mother. My husband was here, and I came to be with him. But after we had two more girls, immigration caught him and sent him back. When they took him, I hollered and screamed, Honest to God, I miss him. She set her coffee cup back onto the table and picked up one of her daughters. Miss my kids in Mexico, too. They're sick. That's why I have to stay here and work. Do you earn enough to help them, Julia asked. A little, a little, Marta responded, shaking her flowing clothes. I sat at the table, watching Julia, Marta, and Oscar, who seemed so sick and strange. Papa, I don't know if I can do it, I said to myself. We had a friend named Beatrice in Mexico, Julia said to Marta. She told us how we would have to live, way up north like this. She said we'd have to be invisible, never complain, never get anybody to notice us, because we would have papers. We wouldn't have papers. If they caught us, they'd send us back home, Marta nodded. I remembered Beatrice. We'd sat on the floor of her little adobe house as she ground red chilies and onions. Pale blue, smoky light sifted into the dark room through the open door. Outside, a dog barked, and a man was singing. My baby sister Teresa cooed on Mama's lap. Some tried to cross the border secretly, but lots drowned. Beatrice had said, I know people who crossed through the mountains, but they were caught and sent to jail. When I was young, before my kids, I walked through the desert, but it was terrible. She set the chilies down and worked on dough for tortillas. We found two bodies as we walked north, she said so we put crosses of sticks by their heads. I think rattlesnakes might have killed them. She dropped her hands to her lap. Oh, how we suffer to get up here, where we're not even wanted, except to do work that others wouldn't do. But if we go home, we'll be killed. If we stay in Mexico, we'll starve. If we don't go north, we'll die, Julia whispered. Yes, Beatrice answered, you'll die. Now we were in Chicago alive, hoping to send some money to Mama and Teresa. But we had finally paid coyotes, men who smuggle people, to bring us in the, st in the crates. I shuddered, thinking of the crates, and glanced at Oscar. Then I looked at Julia's face. It still held its beauty, with her almond-shaped eyes and the fullness of her upper lip, but her cheeks and lips were pale. The circles beneath her eyes had darkened. Her hair had pulled out of the braid she wore down her back, and her stomach bulged unbelievably. You can stay with us until tomorrow, Marta said, but you'll have to leave then. I've got lots of boarders. 
If only it wasn't winter, she started to chuckle and clapped her hands on the table. It's so cold. Milk from a cow would freeze before it hit the bucket. Julia smiled. I went to the window. Even with the window closed, the cold air struck my face, and I trembled when I saw how high we were. I blinked and looked down again. Other buildings surrounded us, and snow lay on the ground and on the roofs of the other buildings. People wrapped in coats walked with their heads bent down, and I saw no green, just a tree with no leaves that shook in the wind. Cars, more than I had ever imagined, made slushing sounds as they passed each other, and a bus pulled to a stop and splattered gray, wet snow on the street. A man was huddled against the building next to ours and didn't move like the other people. I watched him until a pigeon flew down onto a wooden landing across from us. I smiled because of the pigeon reminded me of the, the Quetzal and of the birds at home. I looked back down on the man. He held a bottle but didn't drink from it, and I wondered how anyone could stand so quietly in such cold. Suddenly I thought, could he have followed us? Does he know we're here? I felt dizzy, stepped back away from the window, and sat down at the table looking at Oscar. His eyes were closed now. Julia sat quietly, and Marta poured her more coffee. Do you have any money? she asked gently. Julia took a deep breath and said, No, but I have this. She reached into the neck of her dress and pulled out the string with a little pouch. I moved quickly to block her hand. We had hidden it so long. Julia, no, I said, don't tell. Yes, Marta, she said to me, and pushed my hand away. I think it's time, and we have to trust somebody. I glanced quickly at Marta and felt color leave my face. Shame burned along the lines of my cheeks. I starved, and I stared at the table. Marta put her plump hand on mine. It's okay, Mijita, she said. I understand. Julia shifted Oscar in her arms, pulled the string off her neck, and opened the pouch. She held the gold chain in her hand. Its color was like sunshine. Mama bought this for me when I was a little girl, Julia said, for protection. Marta bent over it. Well, it'll probably buy you a place to sleep and food for a few days. She glanced down at her own hand. I had a wedding ring once, but it's gone now. Tears came to her eyes. She took her hanky back out of her bra and blew her nose loudly. We'll leave the kids here, get you some clothes from the church, and sell the chain. Tomorrow, I'll take you all to some other Salvadorans. Marta gave Julia two sweaters and a jacket to wear, and they went to the apartment door. Julia, I whispered, be careful. I think there's a man outside. I saw him leaning against the next building. He wasn't moving. Julia looked over at Marta, fears and questions in her eyes. Marta went to the kitchen window and stared down at the street. There's no one there now, she said. It was probably just someone who's homeless. Life here isn't all fresh coffee and sugar. Her daughters cried when she and Julia left. The younger reminded me of Teresa, my little sister still in Mexico. I stooped down and held her a minute then handed her a bottle. Oscar sat on a wooden chair, his eyes rolled up and unfocused. A blanket wrapped around him so only a bit of his face showed. Taking a piece of bread, I said, Little Sparrow, eat for me? I put a bit against his mouth, and he stared at me and slowly chewed and swallowed it. I fed him a whole slice that way, talking to him as he ate it. Oscar, I said, we made it. We're here in the north. Where everyone gets so rich, we'll have lots to eat, and we'll send money to Mama and Teresa can join us. Mama will be here soon, I promise. His eyes widened. And Oscar, you can see down to the street from here. All the people have big coats, even the children. There's snow. When we get some clothes, we'll play in it. I pointed to the window. When it's cold like this, you can breathe against the glass so it fogs. I blew on it until it clouded and wrote Oscar's name with my finger. He watched me for a moment, one eyebrow slightly raised, then his eyes seemed to go blank. I tipped his face up toward me and went to the sink. See, Oscar, I said, there's running water. I turned the faucet off and on as he watched me. I think there's electricity too. I went to a switch on the wall and flicked it up and down several times. The light bulb lit up and went off as I did it. I began to smile, then laugh with pleasure as I flicked it more quickly and glanced down at Oscar. His eyes blinked up at the ceiling with excitement. And I'm going to get some fancy high heels, I said to Oscar. This is how I'll walk. I tiptoed around the room, fluttering my arms with elegance. I'm going to be a special high-class lady. Oscar smiled. 
There's even a television. I went and held his hands. Maybe when Marta gets home, she'll let us watch it. Oscar smiled wider. See, Oscar, see how much hope there is? Then I remembered the man outside. Maybe he'd noticed the light blinking off and on. I hurried to the window, flattening my back against the wall as I stared outside, over my shoulder. The man had come back to the building next door and was looking up in our direction. I felt sweat roll down my face. Oscar whispered, Maria. I moved away from the window, down to his level, so his eyes met mine. Maria, he said. Papa says the shadow man is coming. Tears filled my eyes, and I bent his head against mine. Oh, Oscar, you're okay. Papa, Mama, I cried. What am I going to do? We sat still until I heard movement and looked up. Tomas stood on his right foot in the kitchen doorway. I lowered my eyes. I hope I didn't hurt you in the crate, he said. When I couldn't move my feet, I'm, I'm ashamed about how I acted. I shook my head and blushed deeply, turning my face away. I remembered the pressure of his body as we were pushed together. How's your foot? I whispered. It hurts real bad. How's he? He nodded toward Oscar. I shook my head. Not good. Tomas hopped over toward the window. I continued to look away. I hate it when it's cold up here, he said. The trip was worse than before. I glanced up at him while he was looking out the window. In the daylight, I saw that his hair was brown and curly and fell over his forehead. Not black, straight hair like mine. Then I thought of the man outside. I opened my mouth to warn him, but no words came out. Tomas turned toward me before I could drop my face. For an instant, I saw his eyes. They were blue, like our sky at home. I trembled. I was so embarrassed, but I felt the touch of the blue, like light on my face. Why does he have blue eyes, I wondered. His skin was nearly as dark as mine. Tomas kept speaking as he limped to the sink. Where we lived, when I was little, it was never cold like this. Just during the rains, it was sort of cold. And when I'd swim away, out into the water, but the sun was warm, even in the water. I didn't know what to say. I'd never been alone like this with a boy before, so I waited silently for Julia and Marta re to return. I checked the window twice, but the man was gone. Finally, I heard a noise outside the door, and Marta came blustering in, followed by Julia. They were carrying clothes. I felt tears of relief in my eyes. Marta looked over at me and said, That man, the one you were afraid of? No problem. He's just a bum. Later, Marta turned on the television, and we sat staring at it, our mouths open, as we watched a program called Popeye the Sailor Man. Cartoon drawings of a strange shaped man and an odd skinny woman bounced all over the screen while loud, exuberant music played in the background. The old woman, Dona Elena, came again that evening and changed the dressing on Tomas's foot. She said part of the Holy Rosary for him as he lay propped on the couch and I knelt on the floor. Before she left, she placed her hand on mine. It was soft and strong, and I could feel the lines, like gullies on her skin. After she had gone, the imprint of her hand stayed with me. My hand tingled and smelled of her, and I thought of the moss on high rocks near our home and a spring that seeped out of the stones and trickled down the hill.